Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. Vedic by K.J. Heritage The dead don't always die. Top company scientist Chin Jelinek has committed suicide. Vedic, a half-alive empath with no memory of who or what he is, will die in six hours if he can't find out why, or so the company tells him, an added incentive to get the job done. Our hero soon discovers he is one of the skilled, a genetically enhanced human revered and despised in equal measure, a bloodhound with a terrifying past who'll stop at nothing in his pursuit of the truth. And the skilled always get their guy, don't they? Vedic, number one, by KJ Heritage, on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. KJ Heritage's uncanny sense of pacing and story puts him at the forefront of today's speculative fiction writers. Gritty, intense, and compelling, Vedic is something you don't run into often enough in sci-fi, a cerebral thrill ride you don't want to end. Prepare to lose sleep reading Vedic, delicious science fiction. That's what other people are saying about it. Find out for yourself. Vedic, the first book in the series by K.J. Heritage. Jasper T. Scott, his box set Dark Space, the complete series. This is six books bundled together on sale now for 99 cents. Six complete books, over 600,000 copies sold. More than 2,000 pages of epic space opera for the low price of 99 cents, also available in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Humanity is defeated. Ten years ago, the Scythians invaded the galaxy with one goal, to wipe out the human race. Now the survivors are hiding in the last human sector of the galaxy, dark space, once a place of exile for criminals, now the last refuge of mankind. The once galaxy-spanning Imperium of Star Systems is left guarding the gate which is the only way in or out of dark space, but not everyone is satisfied with their governance. Freelancer and ex-convict Ethan Ortain is on the run. He owes crime lord Alec Barandi 10,000 souls, and his ship is badly damaged. When Brandi catches up with him, he makes an offer Ethan can't refuse. Ethan must infiltrate and sabotage the Valiant, the Imperial Star System's fleet carrier which stands guarding the entrance of dark space, and then his debt will be cleared. While Ethan is still undecided about what he'll do, he realizes that the Imperium has been lying and putting all of Dark Space at risk. Now Brondi's plan is starting to look like a necessary evil, but before Ethan can act on it, he discovers that the real plan was much more sinister than what he was told, and he will be lucky to escape the Valiant alive. Grab all six books for 99 cents right now. Dark Space, the complete series by Jasper T. Scott. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady. Survivor, Mother, Leader, and Humanity's Last Chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the Unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them. But now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light. And that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out, not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future 
or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today I'm really excited to have my good friend Brian Thomas Schmidt back on the show to talk about a couple of really big projects that he's got in the works right now. Uh, the first of which is his brand new book, a book one in a new series called Simon Says. It's the John Simon Thriller uh, series. I absolutely love this book. It is, uh, if, if you follow me on Facebook or, or Twitter, you'll see that uh, uh, a couple of days ago when from when you're hearing this, I, I posted that uh, uh, that this is a really interesting book in that uh, it is a science fiction book that absolutely um, – hits all of the the things that you love about science fiction and the things that you love about Brian Thomas Schmidt while he simultaneously takes us in a brand new direction. Uh, I absolutely love the book, and uh, welcome back to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you back, man. Uh, it's been a little while since we've done a show together. Uh, I know you've had a busy year. What's been going on? Well, uh, between, let's see, writing that novel and selling a novel to L.A. for film that I had to finish, and two screenplays I've, I wrote that are out there doing. I've, I've kind of had a couple things going on. <laughs> You're also teaching writing. <laughs> well, I'm trying to. I've got a couple schools that want to fly me in and have me do it. I've got um, How to Write a Novel Out, which is a, a nonfiction book that uh, has done very well, and there's 10 – well, technically 11 videos that were produced. They're little 10 to 15 minute videos that are little portions of the book on various things that I literally just put on my website like before the, before we started talking. And so um, hopefully people can get a taste of that. And if they want more, they'll go check out the book. But, uh, you know, um, I, I'm kind of planning to do a series of video blogs on a regular basis, write tips. But I need to get, start recording those and getting those put together. And then I'll start putting them up. It'll expand kind of on what I've done with these videos. But anyway, yeah, I've kind of been, I really like to teach. It's something that I've been told I'm gifted at, and I'd love more opportunities to do it. So we'll see. For, uh, folks that are familiar with you know uh, that that you really have a broad range uh, of, of gifts. Uh, teaching, as you mentioned, um, you are one of my favorite writers, and you're also an excellent editor. And uh, you have a... Uh, a new anthology that you've edited, Infinite Stars Dark Frontiers, which is the second, I believe, in the Infinite Stars series. Uh, the last time you were on, we talked about the, the first Infinite Stars. And um, in, a lot of folks may not know, but you were the original editor for Andy Weir's uh, The Martian. Um, it, when you would switch between writer and editor, um, which one of those do you uh, embody uh, more naturally, or is it as simple as that? Uh, you know, can, can you change hats from writer to editor, and uh, do you approach those differently? Well, the, anybody who says they don't approach them differently would be uh, full of crap, because you use different halves of your brain. You know, use one half of your brain to write and one half to edit. So, yes, I approach them differently. But at the same time, you know, I I think I think of myself as an author. I got into the writing thing because I wanted to be an author but somehow I kind of got got a bunch of success more as an editor and got more of a rep as an editor and my writing got lost along the way so I mean I got into it because I wanted to help people I like working with other people I'm not the kind of guy that sits back and waits for things to happen I like to see if I can make them happen by creating opportunities and I thought as long as I'm creating opportunities for myself why can't I create them for my fellow writers I'll get to work with some of my writing heroes. I can let up and coming writers be in books with their heroes and we can all gain the benefits from it, which is how I started doing anthologies. It's also how I started doing um, originally the Twitter chat, science fiction and fantasy writers chat, which was kind of one of the first live Twitter chats. And that ran for about four years. I ended it three or four years ago uh, because I was just exhausted. But, um, you know, I, I've always been looking for ways to contribute community and 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 these are kind of the ways that i i try to do it so i mean i'm looking at it as you know my job is to 
give you the kind of feedback that's so objective that it's hard to get. You know, if, you're, if your wife reads it, your kids read it, whatever, they're going to tell you, you know, oh, it's really good, Dad, you know, or whatever. I mean, most of the time, <laughs> I mean, you'll get some, some people who have the kind of strength in their relationship that, that, that people can be honest. But, you know, you always question whether you're really getting that feedback. And, and then again, it depends on what, what is their knowledge base for craft. So you need somebody who really knows their stuff who can come in and say, okay, here are the issues I'm seeing. Um, and, and there's, you know, there's a real need for it out there. I also try to, I keep my rates lower than a lot of people do with my level of experience because I'm trying to help writers. So, I mean, I've raised my rates some because I just had to, to survive, but I also, uh, you know, always keep in mind that, you know, trying to make it affordable to work with people. Um, so, I mean, I enjoy the editing, but I really want to be a writer. So I'm really hoping that, um, I can get the writing thing going and writing, writing, frankly, the novels pay more because um, most of the money you get for an anthology goes to other people so you know uh to survive financially i really would like to be doing the writing thing yeah i i think that's a uh something that a lot of people can uh relate to the the pursuit of something that you love uh and then along the way finding something that you're really good at that uh, that a lot of times derails the the pursuit of the dream. Uh, are, are there things that you do to uh, you know other than just sit down and write? But are there things that you do uh, maybe mentally uh, to to make sure that you don't completely derail the pursuit of the dream? Well, I you know for a while I wasn't doing as much writing because I was doing so much editing, and then I kind of burned out on editing. So now I've made a concerted effort. You know, I have half my day to write and I have half my day to edit. And if I don't have an editing project, I can take half my day, my day, my full day for writing. Uh, if I don't have a writing project or I'm behind on an editing project, I can take a full day for editing. But I have established a routine at least where there's room for both. Uh, in between is social media, and emails, and whatever else I have to do. So I kind of work it all in. And, you know, it seems to work for me. I mean, it's good because I, I, I can only really edit with, uh, you know, good, decent concentration for three or four hours a day, depending on how hard the edit is. Some of the books that are re that are almost ready to go, you're really nitpicking, but you're looking at nuance and you're looking at phrasing and you're looking at a lot of the higher level stuff that you just don't get to think about when you're doing a book that just needs to learn how to write. You know what I mean? I mean. Uh, with an author that needs to learn how to write, which I don't say that to be mean, but I'm just people are at different levels. Some people's prose is, is almost ready to go, and you really are just helping them polish it up and, and make it really sparkle. Some people really need to even get the writing to that level, and you're editing with a level of trying to help them get there. So, it you know, they take a different amount of intensity. And so, um, you know, I can only edit for three, four hours a day. I can write a lot, lot more, but I tend to write in spurts. You know, I'll write for an hour or two and then I'll take a break and I'll come back and write for an hour or two. And then late at night, I'll get inspired when I'm, when I should be going to bed and I'll start writing again for an hour. You know, so. Yeah. Um, the, the new book Simon says, I, I, uh, I guess I've had it for a couple of weeks now that you sent it to me and, uh, I finished it several days ago and just absolutely loved it. I mean, from, from page one, I was, I was intrigued by where you were going. Um, this was, in my mind, when I first started reading it, completely different from, uh, say, The Worker Prince, um, you know, one of your one of your past science fiction novels. This is uh, there. there uh, it, it definitely feels like you sounds like you. It's definitely your voice. Um, but there was uh, there was enough difference that that I really wanted to see where you were going to go with this. Um, it, it's near future. So, you know, this is not, you know, off planet. Um, you know, we haven't figured out how to go faster than light speed or anything like that. Um, and it's a, it, it's kind of a noir, uh, you know, crime thriller. Um, where did the character of John Simon come from? Actually, I wrote a screenplay in the 90s called Simon Says. And it was because I used to, I loved all those buddy cop bits, like Lethal Weapon and 48 hours, and rush hour, and all that stuff. So I wrote this this buddy cop movie, 
because I wanted to do something different than the other screenplays I'd written at the time. And it was set in Miami, and it was about this tough cop named John Simon, who, you know, his partner is k- killed, and the only witness is an HIV positive guy. So he has to work with this HIV positive guy. Only he's a little uncomfortable. This was in the early days of AIDS, remember, back in the 90s. So he's kind of like, I don't want to be in a car with this guy because I don't want to get catch a disease, right? So I wrote it, and it was a little, I mean, I hadn't really fleshed it out the way I needed to, so the screenplay didn't go anywhere. But I always loved the story and the hunt. When I started looking for something new to do, I wanted to do something that was near future because I'd really been enjoying the near future thing after The Martian and the number of uh, anthologies like Mission Tomorrow and things that I'd done. I wanted to do something different. I really like crime novels. I'm a huge fan of thrillers and procedurals in particular. And so I really wanted to do something different, but I also wanted to do something greater. You know, the Saga of Davi Ree, which Worker Prince is the first book of, was written as like my Star Wars. It was, it was something I dreamed of when I was 15 years old. It was the kid in me wanting to write something for the kid that, that kid that's out there that's just like, you know, young me. So I kept it really clean. It had a lot of action and a lot of humor and a lot of fun, but I didn't want to write anything that parents would say, oh, you, you can't read this. This book is, you know, Simon says to John Simon Tiller, Thrillers, some people let their kids read them, but they're really for adults. They've got the grittiness of, you know, of, of anything like Bosch, Hill Street Blues, NYPD Blue. You know, they've got the humor of a lethal weapon, and I'm using the, um, um, you know, the, the Asimov robot laws. So all of that is combined. I also wanted to use either current technology or technology that's on the verge of happening. And ironically, when I wrote the book four years ago and had, you know, put it on the market, and eventually it, did, you know, it didn't publish, so I went with a small press, but, but that's another story. The, the, there was technology that I had just made up that now is a reality <laughs> in, in, in police. Uh, so, I mean, I was trying to do, do this different kind of thing, but the kind of story that I like. And that's kind of where where John Simon came from. So the um, like the um, you mentioned the the reason that you uh, you wrote the the worker prints the way you did, and and that was one of the things that that when I started reading Simon says, you know, there's there's like an F word on on the first page, and I was like, oh, this is different, and um, you know, it it, it was a little shocking at first, and then <laughs> but the, but but then. I, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it was it's perfectly in place in this context. And, you know, as I learned this character and I, I got into this world, um, it completely makes sense. And I, I think that's, you know, one of the mistakes that that um, that writers make sometimes is that they uh, they try to do things for effect, maybe. But the context is not right. They They don't give me a reason to believe that or to accept that from someone. Um, when you're working on a new character like this, do you start thinking about uh, their character traits and, uh, you know, why they behave a certain way, why they talk a certain way? You know, maybe they interact with other people a certain way. Do you, do you start kind of building rules for your characters in your world? Well, I mean, what I, you know, what I honestly did is I did a level of research that I had never done before doing this book. I decided when I was going to turn it into a novel that I couldn't do it in Miami because I don't have the money to go sit in Miami and do the research. So I changed it to Kansas City. And I got in touch with the Kansas City Police Department and arranged to do ride-alongs and basically did 10 or 12 ride-alongs over three, four years and talked to a bunch of their detectives and went to the actual stations. And You know, I mean, I did all this research. I drove around Kansas City for four hours one day with a guide telling me all the history of the city and all the interesting neighborhoods, just so I can scout. And I still scout locations. I always go out and take pictures and go visit the location. What does it smell like? What can I see from here? What does it look like? All that stuff so I can describe it in the book to make it real. So I went to a whole different level. And it's not something you can do when you create a secondary world and my own solar system like I did in Worker Prince because it doesn't exist. But in this case, it does exist. And I'm writing what exists. So I went out and did all that. And um, and basically tried to make them sound like real cops and real criminals. I mean, I've spent time now with cops and I've spent time with criminals and I know what they sound like and I know how they interact with each other. And, you know, 
even you could say, you know, certain people don't talk that way. Well, even the Christian cops I've met a lot of times use pretty salty language. Of it's course. the context of the job. Yeah. You know, it's not really, I mean, you, you, part of the job of the cops literally is to scare people straight. You know, it used to be kind of a joke when you, when you and I were kids, they had that scared straight program. Remember that? Well, yeah. they take the, kid, the the troubled kids, put them in prison and try to scare them straight. You know, <laughs> and everybody acted like it was kind of a gag, but it's the truth. I mean, you know, the whole reason that they embarrass you so much when they pull you over for a traffic stop, leave their lights on and do all these things to make, you know, call attention to you when you're getting a ticket is to scare you straight, to make you stop and think, you know, maybe I don't want to do that anymore because that was not fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> deterrent is a big part of the job. But, right. um, you know, I wanted to capture several things. One, I didn't want to do a formula crime thriller. So I wanted to capture the reality of how cases really unfold. And it really is, I mean, there's a there's a playbook that you can go through to kind of research a case if you're not getting anywhere. But what usually happens is you stumble across something, then you follow that for a while, and then it leads to something else. So if you follow the storylines in my book, they may not unfold the way you typically expect them to because they're basically kind of doing a real investigation. And that's what I want it to feel like. And, you know, there's the real issues the cops struggle with from family issues, the stress of the job to the danger that they're in. Also trying to stay compassionate. I mean, there are some cops that will go bend over backward to do stuff for you because they really believe that they're in service. There are other cops who are just burned out and tired and they're just like, I just need to get this done. I mean, I, 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 one, one particular case that stands in mind is I went with, um, uh, my friend Gil, who the book's dedicated to, to a to a, a domestic in the middle of the night. And these people are out in their yard fighting with each other, mother and daughters, right? And he's like, look, finally, he, you know, realized when they were out of control, they're waking up all the neighbors. He's like, look, I can arrest you all and take you all down there right now. But what I'm going to tell you right now what's going to happen. If I file an arrest report, you're going to get kicked out of your government housing and you'll never get back in. And so you're going to lose your home and you're going to have even more problems. Or talk to me and some of you can leave and I don't have to ever come back here again tonight and, and, and you won't have that happen. He didn't have to do that. And he told me later, he said, you know, some cops would have just busted them and said, the hell with it. I don't need this aggravation. But he said, you know, I'm trying to serve the community. So I'm going to make that extra effort if I can, if they give me the opportunity. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that people don't always know. You know, there's, we have a current culture where cops are the enemy for so many people. And it's just, you know, what I what I saw, and I went out there, and I honestly, in my experience with the cops before this were relatively negative, too, so I wasn't sure what to expect either. But there's a lot of really decent people who are cops, and there's a lot of people that are really trying to do a good job. And it's not about racism, and it's not about beating people up. It's about actually trying to help people. And so I kind of wanted to do a story that would show people that side of cops, too. Sure, every once in a while I have a bad cop. There's one in the first book. There'll be some bad cops in some of my later stories. Because cops are human. There are bad cops. There are people who get out of control. PTSD is a major part of the job struggles that they go through. And so some people kind of lose it. But there's a lot, lot, a lot of really good ones. And most of the people I saw were really good ones. And I think that's worth telling a story. Too. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your love of buddy cop uh, movies and, and shows. And uh, you know, Lethal Weapon uh, was a... Uh, uh, was one inspiration, if you want to say. Um, one thing that I love about this book is not only is it near future sci-fi, and so you, you've got some great techie stuff in there, and I, like you, am a huge fan of thrillers and mysteries and you know, procedurals, and uh, and you hit all the buttons there. But this book is really funny as well. Not slapstick funny, like, you know, every page is, you know, guffaws. Um, it's well-placed and well-timed. Uh, and and one one character that you use for for comic relief is this uh, this humanoid android Lucas George. Uh, tell me about the the decision to bring Lucas in, and uh, and Lucas has some challenges with vernacular. Uh, well, I mean, with, with, tell with, me about his evolution. I told you about the original story what line with the HIV positive snitch. I I couldn't do that storyline now because people would think it was about homophobia, and I that would make my main character john simon very unlikable to a whole lot of people and so i i and we know more than we did back in, you know when i originally wrote it about hiv anyway we know that you shouldn't spend your time being afraid of it and all that I mean, you know 
Some of this stuff is stuff that as a doctor's kid, I knew back then. I, I shook Magic Johnson's hand getting off an elevator back in the when he was first diagnosed because my, da I, my dad had told me, you're not going to catch it. And so I, I was like, I'm meeting Magic Johnson. I want to shake the guy's hand, right? And he was shocked. It's like somebody, some stranger wants to shake my hand. And I was like, well, I'm not worried about it. That kind of thing, though, most people would, wouldn't do because there was so much misinformation out there. So I, I chose, what can I do that would allow me to have the same kind of a rub between John Simon and this, this character that he has to team with? But, you know, would not have the HIV thing. So I said, you know, what if he's a technophobe? He's kind of an old fashioned cop. He's been on this force for 17, 18 years. And, and, and this new technology has taken over because that's the real problem that the cops are dealing with that I saw when I did my research. What if, you know, I make his partners an android that's humanoid and he's awkward because he's trying to be more human and he doesn't really get it yet. And so that just, it kind of all flowed out of that. And then I, you know, because I made him have kind of an awkward speech pattern, um, I, I, I have this precocious daughter. One of my favorite characters is John Simon's precocious daughter. She's like 13, 14 years old. Her name is Emma. And, you know, he's kind of been estranged from her. He's starting to get back, you know, into her life. Uh, he was estranged from her because he didn't like her boyfriend. He didn't want her dating at, at that age, which a lot of people can relate to, right? And, 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 you know, uh, his divorce was really difficult because his ex-wife is bipolar. And, you know, it's a real experience that I've had. And in fact, I really expand on that in, in book two, talking about what they went through and what they're going through when she has another episode of bipolar. And, you know, it, it's a very real problem. He really loved her, but they couldn't stay married because he had to hospitalize her against her will. And it kind of destroyed their relationship and made, made her really hate him and resent him. And it, you know, and in, in the process, because of the job, he hasn't seen his daughter as much as he'd like to. And then, you know, his daughter's fighting with him over boys. All that's very real. So that out of that, Lucas meets the daughter and the daughter's like, you know, kind of talk funny. You want to talk like a cop, you should watch cop movies. So Lucas does research. <laughs> he uploads all the cop movies, right? And, you know, he just starts quoting the cop movies to sound more like a cop. The problem is he doesn't know when is appropriate. So he starts misquoting the cop movie, and, uh, and 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 I was able to use a play a lot of humor out of that because the awkwardness of it, and just you know, the uh, the John Simon arguing with him. Why are you saying that? That's not what you say right now. That's not appropriate, you know that kind of thing. <laughs> and I think it's a lot of fun for you know fans of the genre because you know you and I are like, oh, I know that movie, awesome, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's funny, uh, but wrong way to, wrong place to say it. But, you know, it brings back fond memories. Pop culture stuff is always fun for people. So it kind of brings that in. And I was able to exploit that and add to the other things about his awkwardness and build on it and make a really good rapport. And there's just this really uh, uh, snarky banter that develops between them that a lot of the humor comes out of. It it made me laugh in the same way that Star Trek Four did, Uh you know, when they go back in time uh, and, uh, you know, Spock and, and Kirk try to cuss and, and it just, you know, double dumb ass on you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just. He, you he, know, did, he did a little too much LDS in the 60s. Yeah. Little, right. Right. Just the, <laughs> the out of context, not understanding how it works. It's uh, it, it definitely hit that same vein for me. Good. Um, well, that's, I love that movie. That's my favorite Star Trek movie for a lot of reasons. But I love the humor. I thought they really nailed it. If you're going to do a comedy with Star Trek, that's the perfect comedy because, you know, here's fish out of water. They just really hit it, hit it right. And um, that, you know, I love that. kind of humor. You know, I'm always you, you know me. I'm always saying things that are kind of awkward just to like let, make make a joke. I'm always saying things that are a little over the top or a little like weird out of the where the hell did that come from? Just to, you know, and people who know me, they laugh because they get it right away. And other, some people I, I offend and I don't mean to offend. So then I have to kind of apologize. But, you know, if it, I don't really, I only do that with people I actually like and, and, and want to have a good report with. So if I do it and you're like, what the hell? I'm paying you a compliment. You can remember that when you meet me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, it's just, to me, it's a disarming way that as a public speaker, as a teacher who taught leadership development for years, it was something I learned to do that really helped win people over. When my right. when my students at my workshop in Ghana would come, I sat by the gate 
And they'd walk in. I'd never met them before. And I'm like, I point my finger. I'm like, you. You. <laughs> you. And then I'd stick my hand out. Hey, yo, nice to meet you. Welcome. Well, it became this thing, but it was so weird for them because like, well, this strange white man's pointing, yo, what, 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 what did I do? You know? But, you know, at the end, we did the graduation and they, they got all together, the entire class, like, you know, 150, 200 of them. You, you, <laughs> you. They did it, you know, because they loved it, you know. And, but it, it, it was weird, but it let them know that I had a sense of humor about things. And it, it made them like me because they saw that I wasn't so, you know, they, a lot of these people, especially in that culture, um, there's a certain distance between you and your elders and you have to defer to them at all times. You can't eat meals with them. They think. I brought them down to my level right away and let them know that I was you know, talking to them almost as an equal, and it just helped a lot. So that kind of humor is something that Lucas is using to kind of win people over. But it backfires a little bit on him, and we'll see even more of that in book two uh, as he's trying to adjust. Well, I, I think that's an element that's missing from a lot of uh, some of a lot of science fiction for sure, uh, and and a lot of the police procedural. Uh, kind of stuff as well is that is it life is not all seriousness it's not all um uh you know uh, business all the time uh you know there's there's humor in everyday life especially in the dark spots of life you know gallows humor is something yeah. that uh, you know me and my family are well versed in and uh you know dark humor and well my you know, family you, you, too you know i grew up the son of a doctor and a nurse we talk about surgery <laughs> at the dinner right. table right right it's like dad you're talking about brain surgery we're eating spaghetti a little too close to home dad. <laughs> you know that, at least you weren't eating chitlins yeah right i mean that's the kind of thing so so yeah, and cops are like that, too, because they see the horrible stuff all day long and really difficult people and stress. And people treat them like crap, and they're dealing with people who are just being dumb and being dumb in ways that are really, you know, going to hurt people. And so they learn the gallows humor, too. So I, I found real real cops do actually quote cop readers quite a bit, but they usually quote them to each other, not to their suspects. So, <laughs> right. you know, I, I kind of played on it a little bit. But, yeah, I mean, it's I think that gallows humor – uh, is how people cope. Uh, keep keep themselves, you know, when they're stressed out. It making yourself laugh it relaxes you. It 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 settles, it calms your nerves a little bit. Well, as a writer, um, you know, uh, you mentioned earlier about that that uh, Simon could have been an unlikable character. There there's there's a line there that you could have crossed, and you would have lost people with him. But he's very endearing pretty quickly in the book. Um, how, as a writer, how can you use humor to win a reader over? Like, you know, if if someone gets me to laughing or, or makes me just really fall in love with a character, I will forgive a lot of things in the story if you've engaged me emotionally in that way. Um, how how can you use that as a writer to to win readers over well it's funny you say that because i actually had a reviewer who who thought he was a little too angry and she was uncomfortable with him until like later in the book when he has some softer moments but uh i, I read that review i thought that was I, I didn't think they read the same book i did well i mean she also admitted that she was kind of a, a bit of a prude and the language was a little too much for her so in fairness i mean she was at least honest about uh who she is but i I, she also read an earlier version of the book. One of the last things I worked on was people saying, you know, he's a little bit too much of a jerk here. You need to soften this a little bit. You need to do a little bit more. So I actually worked on softening him a little bit because some of the stuff came up a little more mean-spirited than I intended, or I didn't have enough context for why is he this way. And I went back and expanded the storyline, uh, explaining his wife's his bipolar and all the issues that they've had and how much he loved her and what he went through and, the pain of the divorce, and that really kind of softened it for him. And between that and his daughter, the relationship with his daughter also softened. You know, by the end of the book, at first he really resents Lucas, and he's just like, he's just a means to an end. He really doesn't want to be with him. He just wants to get the information he needs, find his partner, and he couldn't care less about the guy. But by the end of the book, they're friends. Uh, and by the end of book two, they become partners. You know, uh, so, I mean, it's, you know, cop partners. So it's, it's one of those things that um, I think the the for me the humor is disarming. It it 
it shows that a person isn't always to be doesn't take themselves too seriously. It's hard not to like somebody who, who doesn't take themselves too seriously. Um, and at the same time, uh, it shows a certain level of intelligence and a certain level of willingness to play and have fun with interacting with other people that is engaging. And so finding the right balance of that is really, really hard. But uh, the character grows over the course of the first book. He's a lot more angry at the beginning than he is at the end. And he's a lot more, he gets softer because of his relationship with his daughter and his relationship with Lucas in a way that he, you know, we see how much he really cares and that his, his anger comes from his passion and his compassion. And, and I think that you have to build real emotions behind the humor if you want it to work. You can't just tell jokes for the sake of telling a joke. You actually have, it has to come from somewhere. And it has to come from somewhere that's part of who they are and part of how they express themselves and motivated by very real feelings and very real thoughts and, and all those kind of things. And, and I, in this case, I think, you know, that's very clear that that's where Lucas is coming from. Over the course, you see that's where John's coming from. And that's why people like John Simon. Speaking of the character of Lucas, how can you take a character like that, an android, and have character growth? Uh, you know, I, I think we I, – I know I've read a lot of science fiction who uh, – that books that, that take a character like that and he is a static character from beginning to end all through the series, no growth. Um, and then I've also seen it done where you have a character like this and there's so much character growth you forget that he's a non-human and he, he just becomes another human character in the story. How can you preserve his non-humanness while giving him an arc? Well, first of all, I have the internal monologues of the characters, in particular Simon, reminding us that he's a robot from time to time. He's an android or he's a robot, right? That he, he's like, you know, he almost seemed like, for just a moment, he seemed like an android again or whatever. That kind of reminds us, oh yeah, this guy's an android. Okay, that's one little trick that you just by subtle having those thoughts in there reminds you. But, you know, giving him those speech ticks is important. And and I decided early on that I wanted him to be the coolest android since C-3PO. And the only way to do that, or, or R2-D2 for that matter, whichever you prefer, the thing I like about C-3PO and R2-D2 is if you watch the arc of the original trilogy and even some of the later stuff, they grow characters they really become they go from really being awkward and kind of self-centered and just really stubborn to you know really you know being compassionate and caring and 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 getting smarter and learning how to and they build this rapport with, and understanding their human friends and so on you know all of that and loyalty and loyalty and all of that and and so that you know you have to give them some kind of human traits or at least a uh, representation of that. And that allows you to kind of, I think, make that character less static and show a growth arc. I mean, I think Lucas has a really strong arc in, in book two because he goes to the academy to become a cop. And, um, you know, he has, he has the emotion chip and he's got some new modified programming because he has to you know, the, the, the Azimuth laws have to have exceptions because he's a cop and there's all these things, you know, that, that, that he goes through that kind of helps build the arc. So that's how I took it from where he was in book one, where he's just trying to get his footing and figure out how to be more human. And, to, and now he's trying to figure out how to be a good cop, you see. And in the third book, he's going to be learning how to be a good detective because he's going to be a detective, John's partner. And um, he, he, he comes up against rogue androids and it really scares him because you know just when people are starting to accept him he's afraid that they'll be afraid of his type all over again and so you know these are the kind of ways that i'm planning out storylines that that are allowing me to show the different areas of growth and i think you have to really think it through right well book one simon says is out now um i i know that you just finished book two today that that, that we're recording this um, when will that book be released? Mid-February, and book three should be out in in June. Okay, okay. Um, did you conceive this as a trilogy from the beginning? Oh, no, it's actually it's actually standalone novels. And I, 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 I actually have six or seven of them that are 
roughly planned at this point. So if, if, if people like them and they go well, I'll keep writing them. I, I could do, you know, I could do 22 or, or however many of these down the line, I'm sure. Uh, and I love writing these characters, so I wouldn't have a problem. But, you know, I'm only going to do it if people really want it. <laughs> so, well, well, sure, sure. But yeah. um, when, when you plan out a series like that and, and standalone novels, meaning um, that, that anyone could pick up anyone in the series and 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 jump into, you know, an adventure with these characters, uh, what about, you know, kind of meta story arc? Um, do you plan out, okay, I, I'm Simon is going to grow – in this way from, from this book to this book. And are, are there things that you worry about uh, because they are recurring characters? Uh, are there things that you worry about you know, spoiling for people that read out of order? Well, you, you do have to find a balance and it's hard because in book two, if people pick it up, you've got to give them a little bit of a backstory on what happened in book one or their law. But, but, you know, my editor and I were struggling a little bit over it because he's like, well, you say that, you're going to spoil book one. And I'm like, well, if they're reading book two, too, they really need to know that. So if that spoils book one, tough on them for starting with book two. But, you know, I, there's only you have to find a balance and it's tough. You, you, you don't want to tell them too much detail, but you have to get up to certain points about certain things that have happened, which inevitably becomes a spoiler at a certain point. So, I mean, I, I, I do think through that. I think through the ways that I can keep them going. That's why in book two, I show us a lot more about his relationship with his ex-wife and why that's so difficult and how that's really affected him. And um, his relationship with Emma's going to evolve in book three more. He's going to start dating again. We're going to see, you know, that whole thing. You know, and there's a through arc for the series, too, about foreigners and this whole conspiracy that underlies what the the bad guys are doing. They're they're basically art thieves that are hiding nanochips inside art uh, with government secrets and smuggling them that way. And that's what the story is in book one. I don't think that's a spoiler. That's pretty much the high tech mystery that they're trying to figure out. Uh, you know, but those guys are part of a larger conspiracy with people that are from overseas that are kind of who are these people? And they seem like they're a bigger threat than just this one problem. Well. Those guys come back in book two and are a little involved in what happens there. And, you know, I don't think I don't I don't I don't think they're going to be in book three, but I think they'll we'll see them popping out throughout the course of the series. And eventually we'll get by getting little bits and pieces. We'll have an entire book where it comes to a head. You know, I that's just happened in, in the Charlie Parker series with John Connolly. The, I'm reading the book, his latest book right now, Book of Bones, and he's finally bringing that long arc that's gone over like eight or ten books to a head. You know, and uh, and Craig Johnson just did it with with his his Longmire book. Um, what was it? Depth of Winter, where he brought it to a head, a long storyline. And so the next book, he's kind of starting over with kind of a new, larger arc for the series. That's the kind of thing that you have to you have to think through. But the beauty of it is, if you have a long run of it, you you don't have to think it through all in in too much detail if you don't want to. You can kind of see where it goes but you'll be set up enough that there's a lot of potential. The, um, I, I absolutely love the first book. I can't wait to see what you put them into next. Um, I, I think this is going to be a smash hit, uh, as people start to read it. Uh, you also have a new book coming out, uh, next week and it's, uh, your latest anthology that you curated and, and edited, uh, infinite stars, dark frontiers. Uh, this is a this is a crazy collection. Uh, you know George R. R. Martin, uh, Becky Chambers, Jack Campbell. We got you know reprints in there. Uh, Heinlein, uh, or got Orson Scott Card, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. What, Arthur C. Clarke. I, I knew I was going to skip over somebody. Um, how does a, how does a collection like this get going? Well, Titan approached me in 2015 at Sasquatch, which was Spokane. Uh, world World Cup, and they wanted to do a definitive collection of space opera and military sci-fi. They knew I was really big into space opera because I'd done the Davi Re and I'd done a couple other space opera in both. And they said, what we want to do is a mix of new stories in popular existing series, a few new stories in you know new series, and classic reprints that are like the best of the subgenre. But you're going to have to do more than one volume to unfold. You can't get everything in the first book. So 
there were there are still things that I haven't been able to get. It took me a while to find, for example, a standalone Lensman story by E. Doc Smith. E. Doc Smith is widely credited as starting space opera, but he didn't write a lot of really short, short fiction. I finally found one, but I didn't find it until book two. So that's why E. Doc Smith wasn't in book one, but he's in book two. Um, the, the James S. C. Corey guy, their reprints are really expensive right now because of the TV show, so I haven't been able to afford them to get 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 them in, in, in the book, so they're not in yet. So there's things that I hope to get later on. But my point is that, you know, that's why I kind of mix it up and have a lot of different variety of things from the course of, you know, when Space Opera started in the, back in the 30s all the way through modern times, and I try to touch on a number of different things. And I want what I want is so that you, if you like space opera and military sci-fi, you can literally take this, these books and build yourself a library of the best of the best, and you'll have a good taste of what's out there that you might want to read more of, and you'll have a good taste of history too of where it came from. Well, I have I have bookshelves all over the house, and we get books in the mail just about every day. But I have a shelf right beside my desk that's a collection of my favorite books or references and just things that I want to have close at hand. And the first Infinite Stars is right here on the end of my shelf. And, you know, as as I've been working on a science fiction uh, space opera series, I, I find myself pulling that book down and reading through it uh, numerous times this year. There's just something about you know, when when you want to get in that headspace surrounding yourself with those the strong voices and the, the people that have gone before us, you know, more than just as a as a fan. You know, I love these kinds of stories yeah. and I read them as a fan. But, you know, in a from a professional standpoint, there's something about uh looking back at people that did it before you and, and learning from them and, and getting really just immersing yourself in the the vernacular and the uh, just the the way these kinds of stories are are told, and I think they're great resources for that as well. You know, that's how I work. Uh, I hear a lot of writers saying, "I can't read in the genre I'm writing. I'm so afraid I'm going to copy something." Man, I want to read in the genre I'm writing so I get the feel. When I wanted to make Worker Prince feel like Star Wars, I read Star Wars books, and a lot of people read it, and they were like, yeah, "It's like Star Wars with different characters. It really has that feel." Because I can then get that feel, and I can imitate it, even though I'm doing something completely different. And sure, every once in a while, I'll borrow a trope and or borrow a scene and kind of do a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, because I'm a fan of a lot of different things. And there were a lot of things in Worker Prince that were pop culture references because of that. I did a little tribute to Superman, the movie, and a little tribute to Battlestar Galactica, and a little tribute to the, you know, I did all that stuff. But, but I made it its own thing at the same time, and it was appropriate in the context. I do the same thing with Simon Says. I'm reading a lot of crime books. So I'm heavily influenced by Bosch and Michael Connolly. And I'm, I'm very influenced by John Connolly uh, and his Charlie Parker series, which is probably literary wise, one of the best written series overall, as far as words of anything in crime fiction today. I, John Connolly, I know Tamara Pearson, I used to compare notes about it because we were always quoting it to each other because some of his, his, it's just like poetry. It's like, holy crap, how did he come up with these descriptions? My God, you know, he's just really good. He's also very funny. Um, and, you know, I read Craig Johnson and I read C.J. Box and David Baldacci and, and Harlan Coben and all these guys because it gives me and Karen Slaughter is a new one I've discovered that I'm really a big fan of. You know, a, lo a lot of women uh, that I've discovered in crime fiction kind of write a little more of the romance angle, angle. She doesn't do that. She's really writing gritty cop stuff like what I'm writing. And so I've really taken to her books. Now, it's nothing wrong with the romance. Don't get me wrong. It's just it's not what I'm doing. It's not the feel I'm trying to capture. So, uh, well, there are a lot of female voices in that genre that are just crushing it right now. Yeah, there are. And I'm, I'm discovering more every day and I'm enjoying that. It's, it's, uh, it's actually a really cool time for that because thrillers used to really, the, you know, be all men. Everybody would say, oh, the, all the big thriller author, authors are men. Uh, and it's not, not the case anymore. You're, you're finding people breaking out of it and that's good. That's good. That's a healthy thing. It is. It is. Uh, well, that that book, Infinite Stars: Dark Frontiers, uh, will be out November fifth. Uh, is there going to be a? Well, you alluded to this is you're really planning out a long uh, series of these. Uh, are, are you starting to work on book three yet? Oh, I actually have a list of the reprints I want to get and of the authors I want to invite, and uh, a rough budget. But it, it, I won't get the go ahead until they see how sales are for 
Dark Frontier. So it's it's six to eight months away before I know whether we're going to be able to do a, a third volume because it's all dependent on sales. Um, but the first book, you know, in the for, for, in less than a year sold 10,000 copies. So, you know, if it had sold them faster, it would have been on the New York Times list, but it didn't sell them quite fast enough. But it was definitely reached a national bestseller level. So, I mean, if I'm hopeful that you know, people like it enough, they'll want, they'll want more. Um, the second book, in my opinion, is just as good as the first book. Um, well, it sure looks like the it. The essay that, uh, the first book had an incredible essay by Robert Silverberg. The second book has an incredible essay by um, David Weber. And it's him talking about kind of the difference between military sci-fi and, and, and space opera and kind of addressing all of that. I'm trying to give historical perspective through these essays. In the third book, I'm hoping to have an essay about space opera and military science fiction in media and television and film, because I'd like to give some perspective on that, because that's the way a lot of people first hear of those subgenres. But we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, I, I all, the books are written to be, like I said, kind of collectible and scholarly at the same time. And um, and I, it's, they're sure fun to put together, but uh, they're also really thick, though. They're the kind of they are their they're, they're doorstop. They're what we call a chihuahua <laughs> killer. You drop that book on an average sized chihuahua and you kill the dog. Uh, right. yeah, I mean, you know, they're six six hundred page books, but um, yeah. But I I I hope people get their money's worth. Absolutely. Oh well, that book will be out November fifth. Infinite Stars, Dark Frontier. Simon says book one of the John Simon Thriller series uh, is out everywhere now. It's in uh, Kindle Unlimited even. So if you're yep. A Kindle Unlimited subscriber, you can pick it up on your Kindle for free. Uh, are you planning audio for this? Well, I've got to get somebody to want to do the audio for this, and then yes, I will. Um, but uh, right now, I don't have that lined up. It's out in hardcover. It's out in trade paperback, uh, and eventually, you know, I hope to have audio. Um, I, it's small press, so getting somebody to do audio is going to take a while. I don't have the three thousand bucks it takes to hire a decent, uh, decent narrator to do it. So um, I will hopefully happen. If it takes off, I'm sure we'll get audio going. Yeah, I, I would love audio of this because the, this is this is a book that that demands to be acted well. So yeah, I, I mean I it would be to... fun, and a lot of people tell me they they picture it as a TV series or a movie too. Which you know, given that I wrote it as a screenplay first, it makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, who knows? Well, I love it. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, thanks for coming back on to talk about it. Um, sure. We look forward to February for book two uh, and then summer for book three. I can't wait to see what the series does. Uh, uh, love you, brother. Thanks for coming back on. Hey, thanks for having me. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, tell everybody real quick before we go where they can find you online. I, I know you mentioned uh, earlier that you uh, put videos up on your uh, site today. Where can people connect with you? Well, my website is Um, The If you want to read three chapters free of uh, the second book, they're actually on my blog. You can find the preview of the sideband and read that. If you want to read the preview of Simon Says, you can either find it on my blog or at moralesbooks.com. There's a page for Simon Says, and the, the PDF is embedded right there, and you can actually read it right there online and read the first three chapters of Simon Says and see what you're buying. You can also read them. There's a look at there's a look inside thing on Amazon that has the same the same three chapters as well, so you can check it out there. But I, you know, the Simon Says page at moralesbooks.com has a uh, links to IndieBound and uh, uh, all of the places that you might want to buy books besides Amazon. So, uh, you know, if, those, if anybody has Amazon issues, then feel free to look there. Excellent. We'll link up all of that great stuff uh, in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Brian Thomas Schmidt, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Good luck with the show. Thank you for having me. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Welcome to historic Sleepy Hollow, settled in 1640. Jason had looped around the town and had come up Broadway from the south. Behind the retaining wall next to the sign, a yard worker turned on his leaf blower, sending a tidal wave of yellow and red up and over the stones to splash off the windshield of the RV. They passed antique shops, a shell station, and a Food King grocery. This is the same Broadway, you know, said Eliza. It goes all the way down to Times Square. Used to be an Indian trail, 
Manhattan to Fort Orange for the fur trapping business. She kissed the dog. Oh, don't worry, baby. Nobody's going to skin you. And you know what the town's most famous for? Well, duh, Jason said. Every kid named Crane, especially one as tall and skinny as Jason, had heard a lifetime of Ichabod jokes. He hoped never to hear another. Did you know it was a real place? Of course, he said, though he hadn't. Don't be so smart, said Eliza. Turn here. The streets sloped towards the Hudson, the hillside trying to shake the village off its back. Jason slipped in behind a UPS truck and drove upwards. They turned onto Gory Brook Road. He stuck his head out the window, trying to pass. The UPS truck turned aside to the right. And he saw the house. Here! 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 said Eliza. She pointed at the driveway of 417 Gory Brook. Jason brought the RV to a smoke-belching halt. The house stood on a knoll, above a steep yard that angled downwards toward the Hudson. An ancient sycamore on the front lawn leaned precariously. The roof was an irregular A-frame, with a long slope on the left and a short one on the right, like a rotated checkmark. The upper floors were trimmed with bands of chocolate brown wood in a rectangular pattern. They made the house look as if it were trapped behind the bars of a jail cell. A tiny triangular portico extended over the front door, which was rough-hewn, rounded on top, held together by two vertical metal bands, and dotted with nail heads, a gothic novel in braille. The gray-blue curtains at the ground floor bay window gave the place a veiled eye aspect, like his grandmother's cataracts. The house seemed to be inspecting Jason with that eye. What are you doing here, boy? I'm watching you. Eliza put a hand on his shoulder. He jumped. This is it, she said. She slapped the dashboard. This is what? Our new home. But... Jason turned to her, baffled. Her face sparkled with delight. Surprise! 